We're in the middle of page 112. I think we covered part of it last time, but we're going to go over it again. Stress has different functions in English. First of all, it can be used in sentences to give special emphasis to a word or to contrast one word with another. That's contrastive stress. Remember the three rules for what we stress in a sentence? Of course, we have word stress. Remember that we have three levels of stress. First of all, we have word stress, then we have Compound noun stress, and then we have sentence intonation. And what are the three rules of sentence, sentence intonation to review? First, stress, content words. Second, stress new information, don't stress old information. And then, stress items in contrast, everything else is pronounced how? I don't want this one, I want that one. How do we pronounce everything that's not stressed? How do we pronounce everything in a sentence that is not stressed? A low, flat pitch. Remember that, please. A low, flat pitch. Deeping, yeah, everything that is not stressed. We talk so much about stress, sometimes we forget to say how we pronounce all those words that are not stressed. And they are in the majority. Most words are not stressed, usually, in a sentence. They are pronounced normally in a low, flat pitch. There are some exceptions. We'll talk about those another time. But generally, for statements, 肯定句, the unstressed words are pronounced with a low flat pitch. And we can also distinguish between uh, nouns and verbs. Remember, insult, insult, overflow, and overflow, deng deng. And we compare that to Chinese, what? Do you remember hammering something? Ding ding zi and yong dian zuan zuan dong. So sometimes you use tone in a similar way. The way we use stress, sometimes we can distinguish between nouns and verbs with stress. Sometimes you use tone for the same purpose. Neither one is very systematic. In English, it's a bit systematic, but there are many, many exceptions. Or you could say there's a limited number of exa examples. In Chinese, there are quite only a very few number of examples. Chu, xiang chu, and chu chu dou shi. So you have a number of examples, but not a huge number. And we're at the bottom of 112. Many other variations in stress can be associated with the grammatical structure of words. Table 5.2 exemplifies the kinds of alternations. All the words in the first column have the main stress on the first syllable. Diplomat, photograph, monotone. Notice that these words are all what kinds of words? Are they old English words? Diplomat, photograph, monotone. Where did English get these words? Often through French from Latin and Greek, right? Latin and Greek. These are originally from Latin and Greek. Often they did come through French, but not always. Sometimes they were direct borrowings or direct creations of words. Um, so. We have the stress on the first syllable in all of these, diplomat, photograph, monotone. But look at the second syllable. We have a xiang ning si. We have an abstract noun made from these. It's still a noun. But the, sh the stress has shifted to which syllable? The second. Diplomat, diplomacy, photograph, photography, and the vowels change as well. Photograph, photography. The, the unstressed syllables in both cases become schwas, but they're different syllables. Monotone, monotony. Now in the third column, we have what kinds of words? These are adjectives. And don't say adjectives, by the way. It sounds like something totally different. Adjectives. And where's the stress now? On the third syllable. Diplomatic, photographic, monotonic. I guess, monotonic. I don't use this word at all, so it's kind of strange to me. I would say, 倒数第二个音节 is a better way to describe it. Diplomatic. It's the second of the last syllable, and we call that the ante 
I'm sorry, we call that the penultimate syllable. The last syllable is just the last syllable, but if it's the second to the last syllable, we can call it the penultimate syllable. Penultimate. The stress is on the penultimate syllable. If it's on the third to the last syllable, then we'll call it the antipenultimate. That's what I started to say at the beginning. That's, on, that's the third to the last syllable. Antipenultimate, third to the last, penultimate is the second to the last, ultimate, we don't say ultimate usually, just the last, the final syllable. So you can see how the stress changes in these words. This is typical of words that are from Latin and Greek. They often have patterns like this. But words that are from the original Anglo-Saxon vocabulary usually don't behave like that. And words like that, the stress tends to stay on the root. It'll stay on the root in most cases. The original Anglo-Saxon vocabulary tended to be monosyllabic, like Chinese. And when we started adding things on, usually the stress stayed on the root. Um, okay, so uh, we could make up a bunch of complex rules if we wanted to. We could use them to predict the location of the stress in most English words, but it gets really complicated. And that's why when it comes to word stress, usually the fastest way to find out where the stress is is to so instead of going through all these rules to find out which one works, what's a faster way to find out the stress of a word? Listen to the audio file online or look it up in the dictionary. Native speakers know the stress of most words just because they've heard them before and it gets part of our collection, becomes part of our collection of audio files in our head. If we put the wrong stress, it sounds very funny and we'll have to fix it. Like if we've said photograph many times and suddenly we see the word photography, we might say photo, whoops, photography. So as soon as we say it wrong, our audio files will give us a little notice that say, uh uh, the stress changes here. And it's confusing because I know that for the word commit, commit, there's a word, and it's concomitant. And the first time I said it, I said concomitant. Commit, committant, concomitant, but it's concomitant. It's one of those Latin words where the stress changes. So native speakers often get it, not often often, but fairly often get it wrong on unfamiliar words. Native speaker, will be laughed at and corrected by people, or they might say, isn't the stress somewhere else, or we'll look it up, or whatever. All of these are possible, okay? So native speakers, especially with unfamiliar words, especially with words that we read but seldom hear, we often get the stress wrong. We'll have to check. And here it says that um, there are very few examples of lexical items such as differ and defer that have the same syntactic function. These are both, what? They're both verbs, but they have different stress patterns. Differ, defer. Verbs tend to put the stress on which syllable if they're two syllables? The second syllable, like produce is the noun, produce is the verb. Reject is the noun, reject is the verb. We have that pattern, but it doesn't always apply. It's not so often that we have words that have different stress patterns like differ, defer. Below and below are another pair of words illustrating that differences in stress are not always differences between nouns and verbs. Below is a, it's a noun. Below, so it's a noun. A billow. The wind is billowing. We have a billow of wind. Below is often uh, an adverb, right? So, 不一定是名词,动词会有这个pattern的那个中音的差别. And that is as far as we can go today, I guess. Next is going to be degrees of stress. This, is, this section is very, very important. If you can, read ahead. I know you've got a bit of homework before Wednesday. That gets priority. Um, 
That will have to be it for today. The bell has rung. Does anybody have any questions on anything? On the test, on the text, on the assignments, on work that we've returned to you? Any questions at all? That's it. Then we have to run. We'll see you on Wednesday.